Yeah, so Dave, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us um, today. A uh, little bit to get to know you to start with. Why don't you tell us where you're from, uh, where you went to uni, and where you... Wait, the last one. Um, oh yeah, your favourite thing about home. Okay, yeah. Hi, my name's Dave. I am originally from London. I am now um, the minister of a church in Cardiff. Um, so whenever there's a kind of England-Wales game going on, it's always good fun in our house. Um, went to uni in Cambridge, studied engineering for four years there. And... Uh, I've got to say, I love my family back home, married to Sally. We've got four kids aged uh, 12 down to five. So, yeah. So great. And Dave, tell us uh, something that someone has said to you in the past that has stuck with you for life or that's changed the way that you shape, uh, changed the way that you see the world. Well, that's a profound question, Josh. Very profound. <laughs> Today is um, a profound day. Yeah, Dave. it is. It is. Um, I was going to... I, well, one thing I, I remember um, having um, kind of go, grown up and you know succeeded in all the stuff I was doing academically. I remember you know, failing my driving test many times. I, I passed it on the fourth time. I don't know if any of you've kind of succeeded. You've come to Durham. You're doing really, really well academically. You know, music, sports. Third and fourth time yeah. passes are the Bang. best drivers. Day. I, yeah. I did the exact same thing. Wow. <laughs> so when when they when the driving test instructor said you've passed, I was like. Really? I'm not, you know, because this is my kind of real experience of being a total failure. I was like, I, it was kind of a bit like disorientating for me. So that's one thing I remember. And then I've got to say, haven't I? Um, I do when I proposed to my wife and uh, she said, yes, she wanted to marry me. And that you know, clearly has uh, changed the whole of my life. We got married uh, 17 years ago and um, she's a travel partner with me as we uh, follow Jesus Christ together. And uh, it's a great journey to have. Absolutely lovely. Um, we'll start by reading the passage that um, Dave's going to focus on today. There is a copy of it on your tables. There should be. And I'll just start by reading that out. So this is John 1, 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, that world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but the own didn't receive him. Yet all who did receive him and those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law that was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who himself is God and is closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So after that, without further ado, Dave, um, over to you. And remember to text any questions you have throughout the talk to the number on the screen. Brilliant. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, thank you very much indeed for being with us today. It's great to have you with us. Uh, that last verse, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God, as in it, is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Okay, let's uh, remember that as we press on. Now, as we begin, I just want a little thought experiment with you, if that's okay. I want to imagine that you and a bunch of mates were born and raised in Gurik Castle, which was made famous last year because that was the castle in North Wales that was the destination of I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Now, I don't know how many of you are big I'm a Celebrity fans. Um, maybe some are, some aren't, but um, you've probably got much better things to do with your time than watch I'm a Celebrity. But if you had watched it, you would know. And it... Uh, that there was the privy, uh, the castle privy, and the freezing bedroom, and the boiler room, and the red phone box. And if you were born and raised there, that is the world that you have known. That's all the world you have known, you poor thing. That is the real world. You've no idea of life outside of that closed system of the I'm a Celebrity Castle, those four walls. Until that is, someone with a lot of time in their hands, I don't know, a historian uh, maybe, and uh, they begin to wonder what's going on uh, over the back wall of the castle. 
immediately the engineers start tapping away at the the, uh, the walls, trying to work out why the castle was made it, as it was. And a, uh, uh, a, a business student comes up with a strategic action plan to try and solve, is there more to life than the castle? I think from our point of view, the world we live in is a little bit like that closed system of the I'm a Celebrity Castle or the, uh, um, I don't know, the um, uh, Britain's got uh, uh, the, the um, great uh, British talent, uh, the kind of um, uh, the Bake Off tent or the Big Brother house or whatever it may be. We, we live in a world which is a bit of a closed system. And it's a closed system of um, space and time, a little closed box. And back in the real world, it's the scientists, the biologists, the chemists, the physicists who ask the how questions. How do things work? How do gyroscopes work? How do viruses work? The lawyers ask the what questions. What is and what is not legal? Historians ask the when questions. The when did this happen? When did that happen? What can we learn from it? And so on. And the more we study, the more we fill out our knowledge of the closed system of the I'm a celebrity castle that we live in called life. But what if there is more to life than the closed system of the castle that we live in? Outside of the castle, outside of the tent, outside of the closed system of space and time. What if there is more to life? What about the why questions, the really big, important questions? The why are we here questions? Why is life here? And maybe most importantly, the God questions. Is he there? Does he exist? If he does exist, is he good? And how can we know if he is good? Cue today's talk. Now, people have tried to answer that question in different kinds of ways. Uh, some people have said, look, you can't know that God is good. The end. There's no way that we can access that kind of knowledge. You might call that approach the way of denial. We can't know the way of denial. And many people opt for the way of denial because they think that science disproves God. So someone famously like a Richard Dawkins uh, claimed that the whole endeavour of trying to find out the truth about God and whether he's good or not is a big delusion. Uh, religion and humanity's desire to connect with the divine are just an evolutionary byproduct of our inbuilt tendency to listen to what our parents taught us, who listened to their parents, who listened to their parents. And back then, everyone was superstitious, so we can't trust um, that kind of instinct. Richard Dawkins ruthlessly mocks those poor, puerile individuals who can't let go of God like someone with an imaginary friend, Christopher Robbins Binker, if you know um, that story. Let me read you uh, his little poem. Binker, what I call him, is a secret of my own. And Binker is the reason why I never feel alone. Playing in the nursery, sitting on the stair, whatever I am busy at, Binker will be there. Oh, Daddy's clever. He's a de clever sort of man. And Mummy is the best since the world began. And Nanny's Nanny and I call her Nan, but they can't see Binker. Yeah, an imaginary friend. However, lots of people have actually um, identified the, the, the writing of uh, Richard Dawkins as actually incredibly anti-intellectual in the way it dismisses lots of scholarly debate, which really Dawkins has very little authority to speak into. Uh, one uh, fellow evolutionary biologist, Dr. Helen Orr, described the book as distinctly middle-brow in the New York Review of Books. How can I know that um, God is good? You might try the way of denial, that option. The trouble, though, with the way of denial is that it presupposes what it can't prove. You see, it confidently spouts forth that this closed system of the I'm a celebrity castle that we live in is all there is. But it does so from within the confines of the castle. By definition, um, if you eliminate everything outside, then all you see is the world inside. Um, Dawkins, in a book called The Magic of Reality, he wrote in 2011, the facts, he, he wrote, a reality is defined as the facts of the real world as understood through the methods of science, which means things like the human appreciation of beauty and altruism and love, which they can't be measured in a test tube, and therefore, because they can't be seen under a microscope, they don't actually count as real. But yeah, that just seems totally fundamentalist to me. Yeah, we know that's not the case. I think it takes as much faith to disbelieve in God as it does to believe in him. And feel free to come back at me uh, with questions afterwards if you'd like. I think very few of us would want to argue that we're, we're just a sack of molecules bouncing off each other. There's much more to life than that. Surely the, the thing to do is to examine the data with an open mind as possible. 
So much of the way of denial. That's the first option. Others people uh, say, look, we're a bit more optimistic than that. If God exists, let's go looking for him. Uh, maybe he's left clues in the I'm a celebrity castle that we've um, been born and raised in. And you might call that the way of discovery. Can we discover whether God exists and is good? Well, certainly many people believe and suspect that God is um, there and good because of the world they see around them. Um, some scientists, it's true, are atheists, but many others are um, Christians and believers in God. And it's their study of science that has persuaded them. Uh, leaders of their field like Galileo or Kepler, Pascal, Boyle, Newton, Faraday, Babbage, Pasteur, Kelvin, Clark, Maxwell, or even uh, more recently Francis Collins, who's uh, the head of the National Institute of Health in the States and uh, uh, led the Human Genome Project. In fact, so convinced of um, the evidence for the goodness of a creator God behind this world uh, was uh, someone called Anthony Flew, who was a uh, leading philosophy um, atheist uh, back in 2004, that he declared there must be something beyond or behind the natural universe. Seems to have the fingerprints of God on them. And uh, he wrote a book entitled There Is a God in 2007, describing six different um, dimensionless constants, like the gravitational constant or the vacuum permittivity, the speed of light. And uh, these constants all have to be exactly as they are, finely tuned in order for life to exist. And they are. And uh, the likelihood of that is, is 1 times 10 to the 40. And uh, people see those incredible statistics and I persuaded that a God exists. Now, what does 1 times 10 to the 40 look like? The kind of the odds of um, life existing as we know it in this universe. Well, what does 1 times 10 to the 40 look like? It looks like the following. Imagine if you were to take a 10p coin, okay, and you were to put it on the corner of the beach in Florida, in the States, and you went up and you put another coin by the side of it, edge to edge, and then another one by the sides of those, and kept going down all the way through the beach, all the way through Florida, And then you kept going throughout all the states of America with 10p coins going down, 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 10p coins. Then you went back to start, first coin, put another one on top and put a second layer of coins on all of those coins across the whole of the United States of America and kept doing it and doing it and doing it and placed 10p coins. And you made a column of 10p coins that went to the moon. Okay, And then you had an equivalent column of 10p coins for everyone who lives in North and South America. A billion of those columns of coins going to the moon. And you say one of them is a red coin. Go find it. And the likelihood that you'll find it is the likelihood that this universe would sustain life as we know it. And many people see those bewildering stats and and suspect that, yeah, a good God exists because of the natural world they see. Many others suspect that a good God exists because of the inner longing that they feel. The uh, British comedian Russell Brand uh, explained in an interview with Jeremy Paxman a few years ago that for all the fame that he has achieved, really it's been just ashes in my mouth, he says. Of course there's something more to life. Of course uh, something bigger and better exists outside of me. He says, I've been living for the shadows on the wall, but life should be about um, seeking the source of light itself. Another um, uh, great man in history, I suppose, or most recently, Steve Jobs, who uh, was the the founder of Apple, when contemplating his own death, confessed that, quote, it's strange to think that you accumulate all that experience and it just goes away. So I really want to believe that something survives and maybe your consciousness endures. And many people have had that kind of sense of longing within their own heart, a bit like um, a philosopher 1,500 years ago, Augustine, who once said, oh God, you made us yourself to know you and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Well, the way of uh, discovery with its eye to the outer world is uh, certainly promising and our inner longings, it's certainly promising. The trouble is that it only really yields a hunch and a suspicion. You can't really base your life on a suspicion. Oh, I suspect God exists because of the beautiful world I see or because the longings in my heart I feel. It's not really a knockout blow. And uh, again, it only works with things you can put inside a test tube. And uh, there is lots of life inside the test tube. And and you can live and you can kind of... uh, the, the issue of um, the I'm a celebrity castle that we live in, space and time kind of questions you can put in the test tube. But what about the really big questions that you can't discover through science or through looking within? Why are we here? What happens when we die? 
Is there anything on the other side of space and time, outside of the, the I'm a celebrity castle wall? Does God exist? And if he exists, is he good? Can I know him? How can I know him? And no amount of closed system exploration inside this world, this closed system world we live in, will get to the bottom of that. Now, that has led other people to, um, to say, you know, the fact is there's no way that we could possibly know whether God exists or not, whether he's good or not. And they throw their hands up in the air and they get a bit kind of disillusioned. And you might call this the way of doubt. Like, you know, we can never know it. We could literally never know it. And I guess there'll be uh, some of you here today who have kind of identified with that. Now, the way of doubt has undeniable pedigree. Uh, you may have heard the poster once proclaiming the only thing Descartes could be sure of was his doubts, after which some um, smart aleck had graffitied, yes, but how could he be so sure? And the sense is like doubt is quite you know, um, nice to be kind of nice and agnostic. We're not going to attach our position. Let's sit on the fence. You know, the world is so complicated, isn't it? Like, you know, remain or leave are we going to be pro-lockdown anti-lockdown um Keir or Boris and like I can't decide which way I stand I'm just going to sit on the fence and maybe we want to sit on the fence with God and we're just going to sit on the fence stand in the middle of the road and not like go one way or the other leave your options open don't commit and uh, I suppose some, you, sometimes if you, you hear of someone who is kind of attaching themselves to God in a clear way, it's a bit like you know those holding on to Binker the imaginary friend of Christopher Robin how naive is that and the fact is, in this I'm a celebrity castle of life, the closed system of space and time that we live in, there are some questions that are going to remain unanswerable. We'll never get to the bottom of them from inside this castle we live in, so to speak. If some of us doubt ever being able to find God. He seems so distant from us. Others of us find, you know, doubt that we could ever know the truth about God. He seems so mysterious. Others of us may even doubt that God is good. They think, you know, is God really worth knowing at all? He seems irrelevant. How can we possibly know whether he's good or not? But friends, there's all the difference in the world between saying, I don't know the answers, and you can never know the answers. Because it may well be there are people today who don't know the answers, but that's quite a big stretch to say you can never know them. G.K. Chesterton, the, uh, the um, author, um, once said that the point of an open mind is, to, is the same as the point of an open mouth. It's to close on something. And I want to suggest that there is something you can close your mind onto and, and clamp down on and to think and to consider for the next uh, uh, few minutes. Just as we uh, um, kind of land, as we look at the little passage that uh, we had read just a moment ago. Uh, we, we last heard of those uh, imaginary I'm a celebrity students having a hunt. There was something over the back wall. They've got a hunch that there's something there. Now, suddenly there's a knock on the castle door. There's a voice. This is Ant and Deck. We're coming in. And I'm not going to try the Geordie accent. That's, that's not going to help either of us, honestly. But the door opens and in come uh, Ant and Deck. <laughs> and the fact is that something did exist over the back wall, over the far ca castle gate. And the way of denial and the way of discovery and the way of doubt they were dead ends. What really ultimately was needed was the way of disclosure. The way of disclosure. And uh, as I say, cue the Bible passage we had read earlier. I'm actually going to reread one verse. It's little number 14, about two thirds of the way down the sheet. We're going to focus on that for the last five minutes and then it's over to you for your questions. Okay, so how can I know that God is good? Well, read verse 14. And I hope this will help. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We're going to see three staggering truths we'll close with, and then I'll say over for questions, which you can text in or you can uh, put, put your hand and the microphone will come around. First, great claim. God came in skin. God came in skin. Have a look down here. The very first uh, verse of the whole uh, chapter, the first verse of John's gospel written by a friend of Jesus was, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And then, verse 14, the word became flesh. That is a massive claim. That is a claim that the the, the creator God of the world, the, the one who made the I'm a celebrity castle, this closed system that we live in, squeezed himself down, taking on a human body as a five foot ten Galilean. 
As the Christmas carol go, goes, he came down to earth from heaven, who is God and Lord of all. Is God someone who we can't know? We mustn't deny it. We won't be able to discover it. We need not doubt it for God has disclosed himself to us in Jesus Christ. God took on skin. The creator of the I'm a Celebrity Castle has come in through the, the portcullis to tell us what life is all about. And as we listen to him, we get the answer to the biggest question of that closed system that we can never access because they're outside it. Why are we here? Watch Jesus. What's the purpose of life? Listen to Jesus. What's God like? Observe Jesus. How can I know if he's good? How can I know him for myself? Listen in to Jesus. Now, we've not got the space to go into all the details of that. I'm speaking again at 4.30 today, and uh, we'll ask the question, how can I know God? And we're going to really push into the, the kind of specifics of you getting in on this. But let me just um, you know, remind you, we've seen point one, God came in skin. Here's our second point, God came to be seen. One objection I've often heard in relation to uh, the Christian faith is that it's all very well and good saying that Jesus came to earth, God you know, came in skin, but... I can't see him. I wasn't in the castle when he entered in, when God showed up. Why can't God, why can't God show himself to me personally? Sometimes people say. We'll have a look down in verse 14. Uh, and there we're told that when God came in skin, second sentence, we have seen his glory. God was seen by many witnesses. We have seen his glory, says John, an eyewitness account. And there were many, numerous eyewitnesses who observed him who spoke to him, who listened to him, who reached out, who touched him, who lived for him, who died for him, who were changed by him. Elsewhere in uh, uh, John's first letter, 1 John verse 1, chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. In other words, there were people in the castle at the time 2,000 years ago who stake their lives on the accurate record of all the stuff that Jesus said and did, so that we can now read that accurate record and meet him ourselves. And uh, come back if you've got questions about that if you want to. Uh, suffice to say, though, that uh, when Richard Dawkins says there's more evidence for Jack and the Beanstalk than there is for uh, Jesus Christ, that's just, again, typically kind of you know, shooting from the hip, there's actually far more evidence for Jesus Christ than there is for Julius Caesar, who we don't doubt existed. And throughout the Gospels, John records some of the most amazing, wonderful public miracles that Jesus does to prove his beautiful identity. He heals the blind, the deaf and the lame. He, he feeds the hungry crowds with a boy's packed lunch, walks on water, raises the dead. He speaks with a staggering combination of compassion and uh, tenderness, yet amazing authority. And ultimately, he sacrifices himself to die on the cross for ordinary people like you and me before um, coming back to life again three days later and appearing to loads of people. And it was the famous author C.S. Lewis who suggested the options we are faced with, either he was mad, though his incredible miracles uh, say otherwise, or he was bad, but his wonderful teaching says otherwise, or he was the God he claimed to be. We can really know the truth about God objectively, reliably. We can know he's good because he was seen by witnesses. God came in skin. God came to be seen. And lastly, God came to save. What was he like though? Tell me what he was like. Answer, according to John, he came from the Father. Last few words of that Verse 14, full of grace and truth. And I just want to land on this. Friends, I want to land on you guys understanding a little bit about the God who made this world in Jesus Christ. When Jesus came, he came full of grace and truth. G grace means lavish generosity. You could never, never earn it. It's not miserly. He's not vindictive. He's not out to ruin us. He's not out to catch us out. He didn't come to turn wine into water. He came to turn water into wine. He sees our need. He sees our brokenness. He sees our disappointment. He sees our shame. He sees our failures. And he doesn't just turn his nose up and cross over onto the other side of the street. He moves towards us in love and kindness. The kindest God you could possibly know, full of grace, so good. 
Want to know whether you can believe that God is good? Look at Jesus and full of truth. Truth simply means uh, faithfulness, reliability, the one who keeps his promises. You see, Jesus didn't fundamentally, ultimately come primarily to teach or to heal or even to raise people from the dead. No, Jesus came to die. He came to generously give his life in place of people who had turned their backs on him, dying in place of you and me so that he could be treated just like, uh, God treated Jesus just like he was you or me, so that he could treat you or me just like we were Jesus. Faithfully, perfectly, truthfully, swapping places with all who had once rejected God, but now, if we come to him, can be welcomed as his friend. Final illustration, then we're done. When I was a kid, uh, I um, had a big sister, Rachel, and would love to catch her out with sticking the old... uh, pillow slash complete works of Shakespeare on top of her door. Ever done that one? And then you know, in she walks and down drops the pillow. And love doing that. Um, if I can put it this way, the way we've treated God, imagine it all being written down in a file and a file and a file becomes a, a book, an enormous book, the complete works of your life. And God's not happy with how we've treated him. And it's effectively... It's sitting above the door of our lives. And one day we will have to go through that door and and we will have to face the judgment from God at how we've treated him all of our lives. And Jesus honestly says we'll be separated from God forever in a place called hell if we reject him and continue to live rejecting him. And that judgment that is above the door will fall on us. And yet when Jesus died on the cross, it's as if he walked through the door instead and said, let me take that judgment. It'll, It'll fall on me instead of you. I'll I'll, I'll take the blame for how you've mucked up, failed up all the ways you've deceived and been selfish and greedy and angry and bitter. I'll take it all. I'll take the blame and you follow me through death into new life and you'll never have to face the blame again. How can we know that God is good? We might opt for the way of denial and bury our head in the sand. We might opt for the way of discovery. You might learn some things. You'll get so far, but no further. You may opt for the way of doubt and throw in the towel. Friends, can I urge you, the last week, some of you have got in Durham before you graduate, and that was it, to explore Jesus Christ. Read this. Read a a copy of John's Gospel. We hope we'll get some magazines which will give a little summary of John's Gospel. Look out for those uh, later today. And opt for the way of disclosure. The way of disclosure. How do we know that God is good? We look at Jesus. We see in Jesus God came in skin. We see God came to be seen. We see God came to save. Now, that's enough for me. I've overshot my time. It's time for some questions. I'm going to look to Josh. um, And... uh, over to you guys. Thanks so much, Dave. Pleasure. That was really great. Yeah, we have a little opportunity now for a little bit of Q&A. Um, so I think the text number will remain on screen if you haven't asked your question yet. Or we also have a roaming mic. Um, Tom's on that. So if you want to push back, back at a question or you have one that you didn't manage to text in, then do. Shall we have a one, do you want a one minute break to allow people to text questions in while it's on the screen just to give people a, kind of a moment to catch their thoughts? Is that worth doing? Rather than just going straight into it unless you've got a... We've actually had a few questions oh, come in. Oh, fabulous. Through, let's so go. Let's just do it. We'll get going with, yeah. with those, and then if people have more, then... Great. Yeah, As we go. Yeah, so the first cool. question we've got is, um, how much can we trust the Bible, given that it's been translated and retranslated countless times from several languages and by many different translators who may have put their own natural spin on it? Wow, that's a great question. Thank you very much indeed. One of the tricky things about texture question is it's a bit like there's a kind of a, a, an invisible wall here and a, a kind of question gets lobbed over the top. And I, I don't know whether this is going to land for you. So if you ask that question, want to speak to me afterwards, love to talk lots more about that. Um, yeah, it's sometimes tempting to think that the Bible is a, an amalgam of translations and retranslations. And so, you know, I know Matthew tells Mark, tells Luke, tells John, tells Tom, tells Dick, tells Harry, tells the na- New International Version. I've got this here, like very, very, different and uh, it's kind of vastly different. A couple of very, very quick points, okay. Firstly, what we have in our Bibles is what was written at the time. We've got lots of really good evidence to suggest that. So what we have is what they wrote, 
tons of evidence I could suggest on that. So it's not that the kind of manuscripts have corrupted over the years. If ever there's a slight variation in the manuscript, it often has it in a little footnote at the bottom. But compared with um, every other manuscript of ancient documents, the Bible is you know, head, shoulders, knees and toes higher and more reliable than other ancient historical documents. What we have is what was written at the time. Second point I'd say is that we have lots of good reason to believe that what was written at the time took place at the time. So, um, so if you think, you know, what, it, it was written around the, <laughs> the same time as the events. So um, you know, the Gospels particularly were written you know, within a lifetime of, of Jesus' death and resurrection by people who saw him and knew him, which is like me writing up about um, when I was an undergraduate student. I can remember it like it was yesterday, it was 25 years ago. But you know, I literally can remember all about that. And so when something has affected you, or when I uh, passed my driving test 30 years ago, I can, I can remember that because it was so meaningful. So meeting Jesus Christ, you're going to remember the specific details. And uh, what you find is that the, the, uh, the New Testament accords brilliantly, both internally with what it claims and and with the, the, the discoveries of other extra biblical data that kind of, you know, that confirm that it is um, to be taken seriously. So they're my two points, I guess. So rather than thinking that it was something was written down, then mutated, 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 and then we've got it here. What we have is what was written down at the time. We can be really sure about that. And we can be really sure that what was written down at the time is actually what happened at the time. Um, uh, and there are a lot that you can all sorts of things I can say there. You know, the fact that, um, for example, why if you're going to make it up and concoct it and twist it with your bias, why would you include the failure of the church leaders who are trying to get the world to follow? So, um, so Peter fails consistently. He denies Jesus. You know, why would you include that? Why would you have uh, the Apostle Paul? being Saul before he was converted, you know, persecuting the church. Why would you do that? Why would you paint these characters in such dark ways? Why would you have Thomas doubting? If that early church is trying to convince people to believe the Bible, you're not going to include those messages. You know, why would you have the eyewitness, the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection as, as the women? You know, today, of course, rightly, we want to say you know, equality for, for men and women. But in ancient times, a woman's testimony was not allowed in a court of law. You would not have made it up and and included a woman's testimony to see Jesus' resurrection f firsthand. But you know, that, that did make the final cut of the Bible. And you think, well, if you would have edited that out, or you would have edited out Peter denying Jesus, then actually we can be pretty confident that, that what is written is an accurate record of what took place. So there's, I could say loads more about that. So if you want to either text a follow-up question or come and find me afterwards, love to chat. Or oh, yes, stick up a hand and then a roving Tom in a red jumper is gonna he has got a microphone. This guy here. If you want to follow that quest that answer up, stick up your hand on that issue of trusting the Bible. Um, because I think it's quite an important question. But um anyone wanna follow that up? Over there, great. You mentioned during your talk that some of the eyewitnesses who were like wrote the Bible and what have you, staked their lives on kind of what they were saying and what they were writing. Um, I was wondering if you could chat a bit more about that. Sure thing, yes, absolutely. Well, it, you know, we're, we're told that P the Apostle Peter, for example, you know, he he was a re real coward, had, um, you know, you know uh, <laughs> he was a very kind of complicated character. Uh, part of the time he's like, I'm going to do everything for you, Jesus, I'll die for you. And then Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And, um, and guess what? He denies Jesus three times. And he, he even kind of loses um, a kind of a, you know, in terms of a conversation with a, a young servant girl. He bottles it there. So he's very, very weak. Um, but then um, he's forgiven by Jesus when Jesus is risen from the dead. And he's, he's, um, he's kind of welcomed back into fellowship and relationship with Jesus, which is amazing. God doesn't, Jesus doesn't kind of say, oh, you, you found me. I'll forget you. Jesus forgives him, which is one of the most beautiful things about the gospel. You see the forgiveness of Jesus. But then, no, it, it's true that you know, history tells us that, that Peter um, was um, crucified upside down. The history books tell us that under um, ne Emperor Nero. And uh, he knew that he was due to die. His uh, letters, 1 and 2 Peter, in 2 Peter, he says, the time of my departure is now uh, coming near. He, he knew that was coming. And um, yeah, 
the Apostle Paul says that anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus himself said, if you want to come after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And uh, there is a clear sense that you know, the disciples, both ancient and indeed modern, um, you know, staked their lives on what they, um, what they believed. Now you could say, well, we, we have people today who are willing to, 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 um, to kill themselves over something. But if you knew it wasn't true... I don't think you would do that. If you, you need to be convinced it's true in order to do that. And so they really, really were. Now, that doesn't make it true, but um, you can't say that they, 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 they knew it wasn't the case and so they kind of manipulated and deceived. I think they really, really did believe it. The question is whether it was true. And, uh, and uh, we can talk more about um, that. But I, 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 um, that's a bit of an answer to your question. Um, yeah. Yeah, wonderful. I've got um, one or two that are quite similar, so I thought okay. it might be good to ask this one. Um, a couple sort of around um, what we're obviously talking about is God good and yeah. how does the definition of good align with the modern society idea of good? Like what if my, like your personal idea of what is good and what is moral isn't quite like what the Bible says? Yeah, okay. So um, what happens if your view of good and moral doesn't line up with what the Bible says? Well, I suppose at that point, the question is, is there such a thing as objective moral good? Because the fact is, you're right, you know, um, there have been times and places in the world where some people thought this was good when it was actually a really, really bad thing. So we can all think of you know, 1940s Germany where a bunch of people thought um, seeking to kind of eradicate um, the Jewish race was a good thing to do. You know, they, they were kind of, they'd been, I don't know, gaslit by um, Hitler into being convinced that this was exactly the right thing to do. But actually it's a wicked, awful, awful thing. And so you're right, you know, you, at times there's a kind of disconnect between what someone believes and what the Bible says. And so at that, that point you think, well, just because you hold it to be absolutely true, and even the culture that we live in, oh, we all know this is true. We all know this is good. Well, be careful because cultures have got it wrong at times. And who's to say that in 50 or 100 years time, we won't look back on you know, 2021 think, my goodness me, they thought that was good. How ridiculous that is. You know? So I think at that point, I wouldn't be too worried if occasionally your kind of barometer of good and bad doesn't totally line up with the Bibles because you know, we've not got the best track record of, of doing that. I think um, exploring the consistency, what you, know, you, you talked about, you know, some of the values. I think there, there are areas where our culture today really does line up with what the biblical kind of emphasis would be. So, for, for example, justice, which is a massively important issue today. When I was a student, it wasn't such a big deal. But the equality, justice, fairness, um, you know, the, the Bible is full of a concern for justice and equality and people to be given an opportunity. And so, you know, I think you know, even though we may feel, oh, we're more aware and acutely aware of of injustices today, I think you could argue that we're more just as a society than we've ever been. And um, and that lines up very much with uh, the biblical kind of teaching. There might be other places where, you know, what we think is good today is different from the Bible, but that's that's a different point. But um, again, I'd happily take a follow-up question if you want to, or any more questions coming from you? Um, if not, there's a couple of other questions that I think people might like answered. Um, so, there's a question saying, are there any non-biblical ways in which we can know God is good that doesn't include evidence of um, from the Bible um, of goodness within the natural world? Yeah, thank you. Are there any other non-biblical ways that we can know that God is good other than, so non, yeah, outside the Bible? Well, so, th so this is me saying the way of discovery. Well, I think you... Personally, again, th this is one of those things where it's like 15 all between atheists and, and believers, okay? So it's not like a knockout blow for the believers, but I don't think it's a knockout blow for the atheists. And I think sometimes yeah, atheists tend to suggest, and it's a positive, if you're an atheist, I don't, I don't want to characterise you, but some people say, well, look, look at the world. How, you know, it, 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 it's obviously you know, not made by God. Yeah, and, and I remember there was a, a number of years ago, people like, you know, there's a Stephen Fry did that video where he was talking about you know, the viruses that you know, exist to make children suffer. You think, how on earth can that be in a natural world? How can a God exist when that kind of thing is there? And it, you're seeing that kind of suffering in the natural world, seeing the vi coronavirus, you know, might make some people turn away from God. I recognise that. But I think for me as a believer, I see the natural world. And I think, my goodness me, that is, you know, <laughs> the most beautiful things in the in the whole world, like raspberries. Like, why why should raspberries exist as they do? Or or 
incredibly small hummingbirds or um, you know, the, the, the kind of stunning you know, um, you know, Saturn with its rings. I'm like, that makes me want to praise God and say, God, you must be good and beautiful for making such random and beautiful and different kinds of things. So um, as I say, I think it's 15 all. I think some, some non-believers see some of the hard stuff in creation and say, oh, that means God can't exist. Well, I see lots of the beautiful things in creation. So, well, it, I think it makes me think it does exist. So I don't think you know, one wins or loses at that point. Um, certainly, you know, I've touched on the, the, the problem of evil and you know, that is a massive question about you know, seeing the world around us and seeing maybe is God good because of all this bad stuff. The fact is the Bible claims that God made the world good and that human beings have turned from God and so this world now is under a curse and one day God will restore it, he will renew it um, but there is suffering and brokenness and pain in this world. The Bible doesn't kind of say you know, that's, you know, you're suffering because you did bad. It, it just describes this world as a broken and a suffering world um, but it does offer redemption and restoration of this world through Jesus and uh, that's why you find people who are suffering as well, you know, in this world, as well as turning away from God, many, many people, and certainly my experience as a pastor this last year, I've seen more people turn to God during the suffering of, of COVID than I've seen turn away from God. So, um, yeah. Um, I think I've got uh, another one which is slightly linked, I guess, um, which is saying, um, you've spoken a lot about Richard Dawkins and his re re sorry, view of religion. Given that many modern atheists reject his polemic yeah. and rather disrespectful lifestyle, are there any atheist commenters that you respect or think have good arguments who and possibly who didn't become Christians later on? Yeah, absolutely. Now, so in a sense, it, it's a bit naughty of me to use Richard Dawkins because he's a bit of a, he's an easy caricature of a straw man kind of atheist. And I know that in the last 10 years, you know, um, so people like Julian Bagini, and uh, I, I think who is I think a, fa a fascinating atheist. I think Alan de Botton, who's a you know, uh, and his school of ideas, but both are, I think are really interesting atheists who you know, I think demand you know to be taken seriously and uh, are are much more um, yeah they've not they've not become Christian believers, but they I think are respectful of the other side. I think. Whenever you're having a discussion with somebody and you're seeking to um, kind of engage with them, you, you've not done your work well enough if if they're not happy with your description of their side. <laughs> and I think, unfortunately, Dawkins often kind of paints Christianity in a way that well, I'm just not happy with his portrayal of it. Um, um, but there are other atheists, as I've mentioned, those two in particular, who I think are, are really, really thoughtful writers who... Um, um, who I want to engage with, and I do, and I enjoy reading their, their writing. I think I can learn from them as well. Um, um, and I think they respect the Christian side rather than the kind of dismissal that a Dawkins would, would go down. Are there any more questions from the, from the floor? We probably have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, are there any, any questions from the floor? If not, we've got a couple from here, so maybe I'll do one more question. Um, uh, you've talked about the idea that belief may come down from like environment or from family. Um, did you uh, did you believe starting with a Christian upbringing or not? And if you did, uh, then why do you think you weren't influenced by that? Okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, when I described Dawkins' description of faith as being it's come down from parents, etc., etc., and everyone years ago everyone was superstitious. Um, so my story, yeah, I I was brought up by believing parents, but I was also very sceptical uh, and a scientist by kind of upbringing, and I wasn't going to buy something just because it's what my parents taught me. I think arguably, because I knew all the arguments, I was more critical than someone who was kind of, you know, on the outside that circle who was just intrigued and moving in. I was you know, so when I was at, went to uni, I uh, really, really kind of put the Christian faith into a microscope as best I could and just examined it for what it was um, and was not going to be prepared for the, the, the kind of pat answers. I wanted to know, is it true or not? I was really, really desperately concerned for that. So while I think, yes, um, my kind of Christian upbringing will have given me some vocabulary and some categories that I understand, that didn't mean that I therefore kind of bought them you know I had to do that for myself and in a sense you know what better time when you're at uni and uh, you've got you know, th three four years away from mum and dad maybe mum and dad are strong atheists and you've you've come away and think like I, you, you may have raised me an atheist but I want to explore the Christian faith or maybe mum and dad were Muslim and you can actually want to explore this you know certainly for me having been raised in a kind of Christian environment I was like I'm not going to just swallow that because that's what mum and dad think and uh, I think I was more 
more um, kind of critical and I, I, I hope um, independent in my thought. I guess we're, we're all a product of our culture, so you can't be purely independent, but certainly that didn't mean I, I kind of was went soft on, on the evidence. I wanted to study it even more closely. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, that's all we've really got time for today. But um, if your question wasn't answered or if you want to discuss things th further, um, feel free to hang around. We do ask that if you want to stay inside, you'll have to remain on your tables of six. But Dave and people can congregate outside. It has to be past the fence barrier, I'm afraid, on the race course. Um, but feel free to hang around in groups of no more than 30, obviously. Um, or just to sort of chat and socialise despite the you know kind of grim weather. Um, but yeah, if you want to find anything more out sort of informationally wise, the known website is a great place for testimonials and a bit more about Christianity. Yeah, and just to mention, we have another event um, at 4.30. Um, I'm not sure uh, whether you need to sign up for that. There may be some spaces available. Um, so yeah, if you're keen to hear more, then, um, then try and come along. Um, Kitty may know more about that. <laughs> So yeah, she's giving me thumbs up. So do just come along. Um, you're all here, which means you've all had LFTs. So if there are spaces, you will be uh, so welcome. Do come back. And um, yeah, um, like Naomi said, it's a bit grisly. So if you fancy chatting about the stuff that you've heard um, with your tables, then do feel free. Um, and thanks again so much for coming. Um, and we do really encourage you just to keep thinking about these things. Um, knowing God is the most significant thing that you could do in your life. And it's my firm conviction that uh, Jesus is worth everything. So I do encourage you to chat with um, those you came with. Um, and I think that's all from us. Yeah. Um, so thanks again, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, so and see some of you later. Thanks, um, Dave, for talking and yeah, talking thanks, with Dave. us. All right. Cheers, everyone.